Hi there. Today we're going to be taking a look at an essay that focuses on the diasporic natures of capitalism and socialism and how the two of those have affected uh, immigration patterns throughout the 20th century. Let's get into it. Immigration, historically, has not existed in a vacuum. Immigration as an action, as a phenomenon, has existed in synthesis with factors such as race, class, and gender in both political and economic regards. The Cold War, the battle between socialism and capitalism, is synonymous with the 20th century from World War II up until the early 1990s, and it is the differences between the two systems that has ultimately had a great effect on the diaspora of immigration and the motives for doing so for emigrating and immigrating from your country and other countries itself. Historically, and even in the modern day, a multitude of misconceptions and incomplete analyses circulate throughout various fields of discourse, with immigration being an important, albeit an overlooked factor, at least in some degrees. The experiences of African Americans going to the USSR from the USA, Cubans to the USA in the post-revolution era, and Chileans to the USA in the 1970s after the coup on Salvador Allende are all vital to explaining the class character and the motivational distinctions of each immigration situation, starting with the Soviet Union. Maxim Matusevich's Black in the USSR, Africans, African Americans, and the Soviet Society provides an essential context regarding black immigration to the Soviet Union, citing the rampant racism in the Western world. Matusevich examines the development of both Africans and African Americans' involvement with Russia in the pre-revolution days of Tsarism, moving on to the Bolshevik Revolution and the evolution of race and race relations in the USSR moving forward. Life in the United States for African Americans and other people of color was essentially a living hell with the persistence of Jim Crow laws and institutional racism. In 1917, however, the newly established Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic sparked a keen interest in travel and immigration from a number of African Americans and other people of color under the thumb of American racism. Although, most who immigrated to the Soviet Union had little to no affiliation with communism or any communist party, though a number certainly did, the idea of a society with racial equality and anti-colonialism built into its foundation took existing curiosity about russian soviet society and turned it into a veritable fascination, as the text says. This fascination sparked what is considered to be the first wave of Afro-descendant immigration to the Soviet Union, primarily being away from the United States. A vast number of testimonies from African-American immigrants exemplify the differences in the treatment of black and other non-white people in the USSR and the United States. Claude McKay, a Jamaican writer and poet synonymous with the Harlem Renaissance, was one of the first to detail their experiences in the Soviet Union upon his arrival in late 1922. Upon arriving in the Soviet Union, McKay experienced, in a sense, culture shock, coinciding with his subsequent elevation in Soviet society. McKay had been given a quote-unquote royal treatment in the Soviet Union in comparison to the vitriolic institutional racism of Jim Crow running rampant in the U.S., speaking on the Negro question within the Comintern and participating in the celebration of the Bolshevik Revolution's fifth anniversary. Other high-profile black Americans expressed a great deal of satisfaction in their Soviet experiences. Paul Robeson, acclaimed actor and singer from the early to mid-20th century, was an outspoken supporter of the Soviet Union and the socialist system. Robeson's support of the Soviet system had, um, had unfortunately resulted in a great deal of hardship in the United States, especially in the early stages of the Cold War in the late 40s and the 50s. It was in 1956 that Robeson had been summoned to the House of Un-American Activities to, in essence, prove that he wasn't conspiring against the U.S. government. During this hearing, Robeson testified that his experience in Soviet Russia had been vastly more pleasant than all of his years in the U.S. As he says in this clip, in Russia, I felt for the first time like a full human being. No color prejudice like in Mississippi. No color prejudice like in Washington. It was the first time I felt like a human being. 
Claude McKay and Paul Robeson's experiences, however, are only a few of the many displays of the USSR stance and actions regarding racial equality in contrast to the USA. For a vast number of African Americans and other non-whites entering the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the pursuit of racial equality acted in correlation to the pursuit of employment opportunities and economic enfranchisement. For instance, one Homer Smith had faced prolonged unemployment due to the discriminatory practices utilized in his hometown of Minneapolis. Upon traveling to the Soviet Union, however, this unemployment had become a thing of the past, having found steady employment in the Soviet Postal Service. Compared to the employment structure in the U.S., African American and other Afro-descendant people in the USSR were much better off. In the cases of such people as Oliver Golden and George Tynes, these were people of a darker complexion effectively managing the various aspects of their fields of expertise, whether that field be engineering or agricultural science, something that would barely have the slimmest chances of happening in the U.S. without the potential for lynch mobs to start coming around. Now we move on to Chile. Chile in the early 1970s had been undergoing what was essentially a revolutionary process of political, economic, and social development. Under Salvador Allende, one of the first democratically elected Marxist presidents in the world, Chile had undergone campaigns towards the nationalization of copper and other significant factors in the Chilean economy. The Chilean path to socialism, however, had faced a great deal of sabotage and attempts of destabilization by the hands of the United States through covert means, particularly through CIA interference. Margaret Powers, in their work, The U.S. Movement in Solidarity with Chile in the 1970s, details how U.S. intervention in Chile and the installation of a U.S.-supported puppet government under Augusto Pinochet influenced a world movement against the puppet government and in support of the plight of the Chilean refugees escaping the military junta. In utilizing sources such as Chilean newspapers, and other such documents, in addition to declassified documents of the U.S. government, Amnesty International reports, and other important sources, Powers details the plight of Chilean refugees escaping the Pinochet regime and the effect that these refugees had on the global consciousness of American meddling. Effectively considered the birthplace of neoliberalism, a further development of capitalism and privatization, the Pinochet government from 1973 to 1990 would engage in what was essentially the hunting and persecution of political dissidents. In particular, those in Chile that disapproved of the neoliberal government, in addition to those that supported the Allende government and or communism in general, had been victims of political oppression and state-sponsored U.S.-backed terrorism. To expand upon this, from September 11th to the end of October 1973, the military dictatorship had conducted the detaining of an estimated 11 to 15,000 people in Chile, according to a report from Amnesty International. Not only had these people been detained, more often than not, they faced various forms of torture, forced disappearance and kidnapping, and systematic murder, primarily of leftists. American solidarity movements with both the Popular Unity Party, which is the party of Salvador Allende, in addition to much of the general public affected by the Pinochet regime's atrocities, had been integral in the process of Chilean refugees entering the U.S. In an effort to save face, if you will, the military dictatorship issued Decree Law 504 in 1975, essentially stating that political prisoners in Chile could apply to commute their sentences and go into exile, so long as there were countries willing to accept them. One of the larger issues, however, is that the United States was highly reluctant to accept any of the Chilean people. First of all, the USA had undergone covert operations for years in an attempt to weaken socialist influence in Latin America and was a supporter of the Pinochet regime. Secondly, in line with Cold War policy, the U.S. had officially designated refugees more often than not as victims of communism, thus furthering the denial of entry for those trying to escape the neoliberal hellscape of Chile. 
The solidarity campaigns had consistently urged the American government to allow for Chilean refugees. However, once the U.S. capitulated, the results had been sorely lacking. In 1975, the U.S. had admitted a measly 400 refugees in addition to their families, which is a result of the federal government's inability, or rather their refusal, to provide assistance to those escaping Pinochet's Chile and entering the U.S. The task of sponsorship was taken on by those involved with the solidarity movements springing up throughout the United States, with a majority of Chilean families finding support from such institutions as the Chilean Refugee Support Committee, in addition to the Religious Lutheran Council. And finally, we move on to Cuba. The dilemma of immigration from socialist Cuba draws a multitude of parallels to the situation in Chile. Upon initiating a variety of economic, social, and political reforms, in addition to the subsequent establishment of Cuba as a Marxist-Leninist government, Cuba had been subject to a number of U.S. operations bent on destabilization and the sabotaging of Cuba's self-determination. Julio Capó addresses the issue of homosexuality and the problems that arose both in Cuba and the United States in the sphere of immigration in their work, Queering Meriel, Mediating Cold War Foreign Policy and U.S. Citizenship Among Cuba's Homosexual Exile Community, 1978-1994. to However, their work fails to address the issues of class in Cuba and the covert operations that targeted Cuba since the 1959 revolution. Ed McCoffin's Causes of Immigration from Socialist Cuba provides more context in terms of class structure and distinction since the Cuban Revolution and the effects of U.S. policy on such class structure through the analyzing of CIA destabilization and the colonial history of Cuba. McCoffin focuses on three waves of Cuban immigration. The immediate post-revolution immigration of the early 1960s, the second wave between 1965 and 1973, and the immigration of the Marielitos in the 1980s. Upon the seizure of power, various economic and political reforms designed to empower the impoverished masses affected by decades of colonial rule in Cuba were introduced. This includes agrarian reform that saw the, uh, the dissolution of latifundios, which are essentially large land holdings, and the distribution of land to those without in addition to urban reform that introduced both a slash in rent prices for those renting U.S.-owned apartments and the expropriation of what were basically vacation houses for the Cuban and foreign bourgeoisie in favor of those who had been living without any form of housing at all. Such policies did bring about a surge in immigration. However, a variety of those leaving were those that were, per se, in bed with the U.S.-backed regime of Fulgencio Batista, often involved with organized crime, prostitution and pimping, they were assassins, hitmen, in addition to entertainment and entertainment producers, many of which were utilized in the CIA's mission for destabilization and the spread of misinformation regarding Cuba. The reforms and the pursuit of building socialism in Cuba had been met with a myriad of sanctions, embargoes, and other such illegal actions as a means of weakening Cuban society, attempting to strong-arm Cuba into regime change. The 1965 to 1973 wave held similarities with those in the first wave. However, the aforementioned sanctions and embargoes held a greater influence in this wave's movement. Many that left Cuba at this time came from petty bourgeois or skilled trade backgrounds that had been unwilling to accept the hardships of building socialism under constant attack from a hostile world power, i.e. the United States. The third wave, the 1980s Merielitos and the Mariel Boatlift, saw a number of working-class Cubans leaving the island. However, many of those that did leave had already been relatively well off prior to their heading for the U.S. A number of the Merielitos held employment in professional and high-skilled fields, such as medicine and architecture, although there had been a downtrodden section containing gamblers, drug addicts, and political prisoners. The professionals of Mariel, however, made up the majority of this wave of immigration, to quote McCoffin, and I quote, Despite large numbers of working-class Cubans, the Marialitos were by no means motivated by the conditions of desperate poverty and chronic unemployment that exist throughout the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean, conditions eliminated by Cuba's socialist revolution. They were individuals who preferred to abandon their people's revolution in order to seek personal economic gain, 
in stark contrast to the 95% of the Cuban people that have chosen to stay, to participate actively, and, by the millions, to defend the revolution. Finally, we have reached our conclusion. The immigration experiences of African Americans heading to the Soviet Union in the first half of the 20th century, Chileans to the U.S. in the 1970s, and the three waves of Cuban immigration to the U.S. are all reflective of the influence that American domestic and foreign policy has on immigration. As detailed by Matusevic, African Americans sought to escape racial persecution and rampant poverty in the United States and to attain a sense of enfranchisement through the anti-racist ideology and better employment prospects of the Soviet Union. In the case of both Chile, as outlined by Power and Cuba by McCoffin, the anti-communist rhetoric and sentiment that dominated the West during the Cold War brought about attempts at destabilization and the expansion of U.S. hegemony in Latin America. Each has been influenced by the economic and geopolitical factors of the United States as a world superpower, and the dominance, or at the least the attempted dominance, of Western American capitalism. For African American and other non-white immigrants coming from the U.S., they had been able to escape the racism of capitalism and had been able to establish, generally, better lives living under the banner of socialism. Chilean refugees had only become refugees due to their embracing of socialist ideology and the installation of a right-wing military dictatorship serving the U.S. and other capitalist powers, forcing them to head off for the U.S. and other nearby nations. In Cuba, the establishment of socialism itself, along with the economic hardships that coincide with the barrages of destabilization campaigns, economic embargoes and sanctions, and other attempts to destroy the Cuban Revolution by the American government, caused various waves of immigration. The difference, however, is the class dynamic for each respective period of immigration. African Americans had faced decades upon decades of dehumanization, impoverishment, alongside political and social turmoil in other forms. African Americans and other Afro-descended people in the U.S. had either been a part of the enslaved class or the working poor for the majority of history. The policies of Salvador Allende and the Popular Unity Party had been designed for the benefit of the Chilean working class. Allende's government had effectively been the antithesis of Western capitalism in the Chilean road to socialism. The installation of Augusto Pinochet following the 1973 coup saw the introduction of neoliberal capitalism, in great part due to the influence of the Chicago Boys, which were economists trained in the Chicago School of Economics by the likes of Milton Friedman. This saw that those who suffered or were forced to go into exile had been members of the working class and supporters of pro-worker policy. Cuba experienced similar attacks on their revolution by the likes of the U.S. among other capitalist powers, with the Cuban Revolution consistently facing a myriad of hardships and attempts at destruction. Each wave of Cuban immigration was made up of assets of foreign capital, petty bourgeois, or in essence, generally well-off people that practically fetishize the American dream and capitalist individualism in the U.S. The class dynamic is of vital importance to understand when analyzing why people immigrate to other countries, whether that immigration be voluntary in the case of African Americans and, to a lesser extent, wealthy Cubans, or out of necessity slash by force in the case of Chile. An analysis of the class distinctions surrounding immigration aids in demystifying the general understanding of why people would leave a socialist country, and subsequently, why people would go to a socialist country. The myth of socialism being hell for all who live under it, and the myth of capitalism being the bastion of democracy and freedom, is ultimately busted upon gaining a greater understanding of the different groups' class statuses, in addition to the political, social, economic, and diplomatic stipulations that has influenced these various groups in their respective periods of immigration. There we have it, folks. That is socialism, capitalism, and the dichotomy of immigration in the 20th century. I'm going to put all of the sources that I used in the description. Uh, some of them are books, so there's a chance I may not be able to find a PDF of them or anything like that. But regardless, I will make sure they are at least listed in the description. If you would like to support the channel and support me beyond just liking, subscribing, sharing the videos, I definitely appreciate those as well. But if you want to help beyond that, you can donate to my Buy Me A Coffee page. 
You can either do a one-time donation, which is as little as $2, or you can join a membership. Membership is either $5 a month or a one-time payment of $50 for a yearly membership. And membership does include perks, such as having your name listed in the description as a means of crediting you, a means of thanking you, and receiving reading lists from me. These will include blog posts, news articles, academic books, just a bunch of stuff that I've been reading that I think is important and very interesting that I think other people should read as well. So, if any of those interest you, be sure to check out my Buy Me A Coffee. My name is Jimmy. Thank you for watching.